Okay, the ranking videos continue, and today we are covering Star Trek Online's legendary starships. Now, uh, with this video, instead of doing like a top five or a top 10 list, uh, since there are only like 27 legendary ships available in the game, I figured, you know, like a top 10 list doesn't really narrow it down that much, and a top five list, I mean, kind of does at the same time, but I feel like it was just kind of limiting the choice factor there. So uh, I decided uh, with this one to leave the decision up to you guys to either debate either doing a, uh, a top five list or a uh, or a tier list that just covers all 27 ships and the uh the results were pretty over overwhelmingly in favor of a tier list so here we go legendary starship tier list Before I start, I do want to make clear that the rating system I'm going to be you know, using for this is going to be more focused on the individual ships themselves, you know, their stats, you know, the stuff they come with, stuff like that, rather than the, uh, the value of the bundle that they come in as a whole. Because keep in mind, 10 of these 27 ships come just from the 10th anniversary bundle. In case you're unfamiliar with tier lists, they're very simple. I mean, S tier is going to be the very best of the best, and then it just kind of goes down from there, D being the very bottom tier, so that is going to be the very worst. And then everything else is just kind of ranging in the middle. Let's get started with the first ship. That is the legendary Akira. You guys know I'm already very fond of this ship. Uh, it's a command ship with a secondary miracle worker seat. It's a really good ship. I do like this, and that's why I'm going to put it in A tier up here. But I do, I really wanted this to be S tier. I wanted this to be like the S tier torp build, and it just wasn't because, you know, that it's they made it a cruiser for some reason, which is weird because the original Akiras are tactical focused, and uh, that mix of command and miracle worker makes it really nice and well rounded, but at the same time, it doesn't make it great for min maxing. So it's a good, well-rounded ship. You can do a number of things with it, but it's not going to be particularly good at any one specific thing. Legendary Ambassador, that's going to go in B tier. Uh, it's a it's a support cruiser and it's a 4-4 layout, which isn't great. The one thing this thing does have going for it, though, is that it is a uh, an Intel temporal ship. So it's got a primary Intel and a Lieutenant Commander uh, uh, temporal seat, which is a really nice combo because that means it can use both Surgical Strikes and Recursive Shearing 1 in the same build, which can be a very powerful combo, especially if you have uh, the um, Vanguard Specialist Starship trait, which will extend both of those abilities. But these advantages are kind of hampered with the fact that it is a 4-4 cruiser, which means it's also unable to use dual heavy cannons. So overall, not a bad ship, but that combo of Intel with Lieutenant Commander Temporal could have been utilized a lot better. Next up, the Legendary Avenger. That's going to nest here. That is a fantastic energy weapon boat. Uh, the combination of Miracle Worker Primary with Intel Secondary. Uh, it's got a good amount of uh, room for isomags, but also has a lot of room for the Spire consoles as well. So you, you can go in either direction with them. It's got a really good Starship trade on it. This fantastic ship definitely going to nest. And next up is actually the ship that it's paired with, which is the Legendary Bortosk, which, you know what, that'll go... I'll go in A. Uh, it's a really good torp build. It's not the very best torpedo boat, but it's still a very solid choice for one. But at the same time, you don't have to go for a torp build. You can go uh, you know, with energy weapons as well. It's a very solid ship, and it comes with a lot of stuff because this is one of the flagships, so you get most of the flagship technology set, plus the old, uh, the old Tier 5 Bortos console set. And in fact, with the release of this ship, that actually unlocked the, uh, the flagship set to be usable on every ship in the game now. So uh, once you have any of those consoles, well, you can use those on any ship in the game now, thanks to the release of this ship, which is very nice. Not that it really counts to the quality of the ship now at this point, but still, very nice ship. The legendary Bird of Prey. That's going in D. This thing was a huge disappointment, largely due to its 4-2 weapons layout. Fun fact, of all the other legendary escorts in the game, this is the only one with four forward weapon slots, and it, just, it really killed the whole appeal to this ship. It should This is a legendary ship. This should have had five forward weapon slots to you know get it to its maximum uh, potential. And honestly, even really uh, it being uh, a pilot, uh, pilot intel ship also was kind of a disappointment because, I mean, pilot. I mean, you can utilize pilot fairly well these days since the pilot revamp, but it's just... It's not what I had been hoping for this ship. Really, um, well, I guess Pilot would have been okay, but Intel would have been okay. Intel's less, I don't know. Basically, what I'm trying to say is uh, the setup that the Eagle got, that's what uh, that's what the Legendary Bird of Prey should have had because that fits what we saw of the Bird of Prey throughout the movies and the TV shows much better than what is represented, re what was represented by the stats that are actually on the Legendary Burrell. These were just absolutely 
Ugh, such a disappointment. So yeah, that's going to D. The Legendary Columbia, aka the Legendary NX class, which, um, you know what, we'll put that in S. That is a solid escort class. You know, double temporal seating, which normally uh, two of the same specializ specialization seating, not super great in comparison to having a combo of two different ones, but temporal is a very solid choice. Uh, you're going to have a load of unconventional systems triggers on this thing, and you're going to be able to incorporate some interesting Dusai elements into the build as well, if you'd like to. But yeah, this I'm surprised this ship isn't more popular than it, than it is, because this is a solid escort ship. Plus, it comes with preferential targeting, which is a very valuable Starship trait for beam overload builds. The legendary Miracle Worker Light Cruiser, aka the legendary TOS Connie. That is going in C. Again, another big disappointment because this ended up being a 4-4 light cruiser, which means uh, it's only going to be well used for broadside builds and it can't use uh, dual cannons, but also it has double Miracle Worker seating. Miracle Worker seating is really good for buffing energy weapon builds, but it's only got like a handful of really useful abilities. So having that much Miracle Worker seating is very, it's completely redundant and you, you never end up using all of it. So there's no point in having that much of it. Yeah, this thing was a huge disappointment, especially when you take into account the uh, the stats on the Temporal Light Cruiser, its promo ship counterpart. Those were far superior stats on that thing. No, no, I'm moving to this. I forget it. I'm moving that into D just because I'm still upset about this because this was such a disappointment. I am still mad about this. So no, that's that's going in D. Legendary D7. That's a good ship. This thing is uh, Intel primary with America Worker secondary. Really great for an energy weapon boat. That's that's going in A. I really like this ship. It's, it's fairly small and maneuverable too, so it's not going to feel really huge and clunky like most cruisers. Um, oh, and it has a battle cloak, which is always a nice touch too. Uh, you don't always get that on Klingon ships. Usually they get stuck with a normal cloak, so the, the battle cloak was a nice addition for that, so especially considering it's an Intel ship, so you really want to feed more into that stealth aspect. So yeah, Miracle Worker, uh, Miracle Worker as the secondary was nice too because it further buffs the energy weapons. Command would have been nice instead, but then that would have been really similar to the Bor the uh, the Bortosk. But you know, you you, know, you, you, you got to mix them up sometimes. But yeah, if you like energy weapon builds, that's a really great choice. Legendary Dideradex, that's going to be a B. I do really like this ship just for the amusement of it, just because the Dideradex is like my favorite alien ship in just all of Star Trek in general. But it's a primary America worker, which is nice. In fact, this was uh, the first uh, the first Romulan ship to give be given a full America worker status, uh, aside from the original America worker cruisers that were released into the sea store, which are all hideous. So it was nice to see this one added in here, too. But the downsides with this one, uh, it's a 4-4 weapons layout, which is always kind of unfortunate these days. And... Um, well, the normally the uh, temporal secondary seat would be really nice because that's more unconventional systems triggers, but... Because it has a 4-4 layout, it's going to be better suited to uh, a broadside build, and the thing with a lot of the temporal abilities is a lot of them have more forward-facing abilities, so a broadsider is going to be a little more difficult to set up on this thing because of the, the temporal seating. Uh, genuinely, this if this were a uh, if this thing had been given a uh, a five three layout, it probably would have ended up in uh, probably an S honestly because I really do like that ship. But yeah, with with a four four layout, it's it's staying in B. Oh, actually, uh, one more point for this ship, though. Uh, it does have a very powerful starship trait on it, rapid emitting armaments, really good for a torpedo build. But even if you're not flying a torpedo build, it still does pack a good punch that you can just throw it on anything if you want. Just be careful with it because those plasma torpedoes it fires can hurt you if you're too close. The Legendary Defiant. Now, given that this thing is double pilot seating, you would think I'd probably want to throw this in B, but honestly, I'm going to throw this in A because it really it really is offset by the fact that one, we did have the uh, the pilot revamp since this thing was released. So pilot really isn't quite as bad as it used to be back in the day. And even then you get the fun factor of this thing of being a defiant class that can do freaking barrel rolls. That's just too much fun to give up on. And also uh, this thing is a warship. So it is very powerful for just a sheer, just sheer weapon power because uh, the way warships work is that instead of getting a, uh, instead of getting a, an experimental weapon slot, they get uh, eight total weapon slots, kind of like a cruiser. And this thing was given a 5-3 layout like it should have been, so that was a good thing. So this is fantastic little ship right here. Yeah, yeah pilot seating, not going to be everyone's favorite, but you know what? It's a Defiant that can do barrel rolls, and that's just a lot of fun. Though, admittedly, it is worth pointing out that uh, the adamant 
you know, just pure stats wise is probably a better choice. But again, a lot of people are probably going to have more fun in this. Oh, and the ship also comes with uh, overpowered and overgun, which is a really useful starship trait for energy weapon builds. Next is the legendary discovery constitution. This one uh, is double temporal seating. So again, you're going to have a good amount of unconventional systems triggers and you're going to be able to enter uh, to incorporate some interesting do site elements. If you'd like to, it's not really a necessity. Uh, this thing also has the added bonus of being one. It's a constitution, so it's a very pretty ship and uh, it's a flight deck carrier. So it has two hangar bays. And in fact, it's the only flight deck carrier on this list. Actually, no, it's the only carrier on this list. So this is the only ship on this list with two hangar bays. It's a bit of a different setup than its promo version counterparts. That's the promo version being a Miracle Worker cruiser, uh, Miracle Worker flight deck carrier, I should say, with a uh, secondary lieutenant level command seat, which uh, you're not going to get much use out of that uh, lieutenant seat. But so yeah, this one, honestly, I feel like more people would get more use out of this one. I generally like the promo version better just because I'm weird and I like uh, Miracle Worker ships for the extra console slot, but... All that temporal seating is also going to be really nice just for the sake of build for, you know, having build stuff on it. And it's just this is a good ship. I would put this in S just for the merit of decent seating. Uh, and it's the only flight deck carrier on the list. Oh, and it has a 5-3 layout, which, again, is always preferable. Ah, the legendary Excelsior. Another disappointment. This one's going in C. Again, another Miracle Worker Cruiser. Uh... But of course, it's a heavy cruiser, so it is kind of obnoxiously engineering heavy. Not as bad as its sea store counterpart, the Resolute, which is <laughs> just obscenely res uh, engineering heavy. But this one's not as bad, but it's still too. It's it's still got too much. And at the same time, it's a full miracle worker cruiser with a secondary pilot seat, which yeah, again, pilot's not as bad as it used to be, but it's still not amazing. And the fact that this thing is further dragged down by the fact. By the fact that it has a 4-4 weapons layout. So yeah, it's really not, not the best. The legendary Galaxy Dreadnought, that's definitely an S. That is a primary intel ship with a secondary Lieutenant Commander command seat, so you can do a really nice surgical strikes build on it, or really energy any energy weapon build on it, but at the same time you have this, the enough command seating to do a really solid torpedo build on this thing. And because it is a 5-3 layout, you do have enough room for that Maelstrom torpedo for the torpedo build if you want. It's also a Dreadnought with a hangar bay and a Spinal Lance, which are always fun toys to have. And as to the stuff that this thing comes with, it, they actually packed on all the consoles and traits from both the Galaxy Dreadnoughts and the normal Galaxies. So this thing's got the saucer separation and the antimatter spread from the original the original normal Galaxies, as well as, uh, I don't even remember what consoles come off of the Dreadnought, but it's got those two. None of them are super noteworthy in terms of the game's meta, but they're still fun toys to play with. Next is the legendary Glenn, aka the legendary Crossfield, and we're going to throw that in A. This is a really solid science ship, and honestly, probably one of the best science ships on this list, because this is a full temporal science ship, because temporal is always good for science vessels, because it pairs really well with EPG builds and any other kind of exotic damage builds. And uh, it's also one of the few science ships in the game that gets a 4-2 weapons layout, and it has a secondary lieutenant commander level command seat, so this will make a really good um, uh, side torp build. Its starship trait used to be kind of okay. I mean, it wasn't like the most amazing EPG trait to have, but at the same time, it was convenient for the sake of having it on an account unlock. But uh, then a bunch of PVPers started complaining about it, and it got nerfed into the ground. And Cryptic, for some reason, made it made that nerf apply to just you know game wide instead of only applying the, that nerf to just being focused on other players. So yeah, that the the if you're still using uh, the legendary Crossfields uh, starship trait, yeah, heads up, that thing's worthless now. Still a solid ship, though. I mean, really, the only downside is that this thing was released before the uh, the Crossfield refit was released, so this will not include universal designs on it. Another science ship on the list, the uh, the legendary Intrepid class, and that one's actually going to go in C. Yeah, the this, the uh, the the Glen got much better seating on its part. Really, the uh, the Intrepid kind of got screwed there, being a uh, primary miracle worker ship with a secondary pilot seat, neither of which are particularly good for science builds. So this one really the only upside to the legendary Intrepid is uh, its starship trait, which is the uh, extensively modified warp core, which is really useful for two of the galaxy runs. So if you're interested in uh, spending 15 minutes to grind, e uh, grind a million EC a day, that could be useful to you. But yeah, overall, the legendary Intrepid as a whole, 
kind of a disappointment. If you want a really good ship, to, if you want a good version of the Intrepid to fly, uh, go get the Trailblazer. That's a that's a pretty decent that's a pretty decent ship. The legendary Jem'Hadar attack ship. That's going in S. I'm surprised this ship isn't more popular than it is already. Yeah, it's a pilot ship, so it's not going to be the most amazing thing in the world, but it did get a secondary intel seat, which actually I wish the legendary Defiant had gotten. I would have liked that a lot better if its second secondary seat was an intel seat, but yeah, it is what it is. But yeah, with uh, uh, with this thing, that's that makes it really nice for an energy weapon build, and plus... It also has the factor of it is also the ship that has Vanguard Specialists on it, so that means you can use the... I mean, that's the extension trait for the various uh, specialization firing modes, like Surgical Strikes, uh, Reroute Reserves to Weapons, and uh, uh, what's the other one? Exceed Rated Limits, which that last one desperately needs a revamp. It also has some effects on the durations of Recursive Shearing and Suppression Barrage 2 for uh, Temporal and Command, but neither of those are firing modes, so mainly it's uh, Surgical Strikes and Reroute Reserves to weapons you want to worry about. Additionally, this is a Vanguard ship, so, so it will have the Jem'Hadar Vanguard Wingman mechanic on it too, so you'll have this little tiny Jem'Hadar bug ship uh, flying alongside these two larger uh, <laughs> uh, Jem'Hadar, I, I forget what they are, they're like the uh, the uh, the destroyers or something like that, but yeah, the, the funny, the Wingman are actually larger than the ship itself, which is just funny. But yeah, it's a solid little escort, I'm surprised more people don't actually fly it. The Legendary Constitution Intel Battlecruiser. This is another solid ship. I mean, it's a 5-3 Battlecruiser, and it's a full Intel ship with a, another secondary Intel seat. So it's a bit heavy on the Intel stuff, but Intel is still good for a number of things for uh, for energy weapon builds. So you can use, like, um, override, subs subs yeah. override subsystem safety, so I can talk, shut up. <laughs> and uh, you'll have another a number of options to use for unconventional systems triggers, and you'll be have the option to use uh, surgical strikes, which is very powerful. So this, well, we'll throw this in A. This is a solid ship. And also, um, the console on it is... Um, or one of the consoles, actually the only console on it, is the console from the uh, the original lockbox version of the Kelvin Constitution, which is uh, very useful for EPG builds. So if you like science builds, this one's a useful ship to have, but if you're more interested in weapons builds, uh, particularly energy weapon builds, uh, this is a solid ship for it too. The Legendary Miranda class. This is another solid one too, because one, uh, it's a Miranda class, so it is the king of space Barbie, and uh, but more importantly, it is uh, it's got really solid stats on it. It's a uh, a five three weapons layout, which uh, not not a lot of the Mirandas have. Uh, I think it's only this one and the Soyuz that have uh, that sort of weapons layout. Uh, this one is a primary temporal ship, which is really nice because, you know, again, like I've said with the others, temporal is really good for uh, throwing in some Deucite elements into a build because this is a uh, multi-mission cruiser. You're not going to want to go a full EPG build, but you, you know, you can take advantage of that seating. And plus, it's always good for unconventional system triggers. It does have a secondary pilot seat on it, which, again kind of eh on it on a cruiser but at the same time you can do some interesting stuff on it and at the very least clean getaway is also an unconventional system trigger so you get one more there too the only downside is that it is on the uh the science seat as well so you're not really gaining an additional uncon trigger you're just kind of swapping one out for another but overall i would put this in an a and, and uh because it's a multi-mission cruiser it's got a uh, a hangar bay on it too so uh, the pets on it are decent. They're the um, the Class F shuttles, which are not unique to this ship. Those were actually originally introduced with the Atlas, but they're the, they're kind of the only TOS Federation uh, hangar pets, so they threw them on this thing too. And those are kind of nice too because they have uh, Beam Overload two on them. Uh, I think yeah, Beam Overload two, and the uh, they have a torpedo on them, so they're good for the uh, the hangar bay consoles if you want to use those. And they have uh, emergency power to shields, which is okay, helps with their survivability a little bit. But for the most part, you're you know they're good for the uh, the torpedo and the uh, uh, the Beam Overload two. That said, I would still take the Type sevens over them. The Legendary Ross Exploration Cruiser, aka the Legendary Galaxy Class, and this is another one that I found to be rather disappointing. That's going in C, because what well, with some of these, they took, they really took the opportunity to change them up in comparison to their original counterparts. Like with the Defiant, instead of making it a normal, uh, normal escort like the original one was, they made this thing, they made this thing a warship or the Kelvin Constitution. Instead of making it a heavy cruiser like the original one, this one is a battle cruiser. But with the case of the Legendary Galaxy, they basically just copy pasted the uh, the original stats off of the Andromeda class and then just made it a full command ship and gave it extra command seating. So this thing is double command. 
So because of all that, this thing still faces a lot of the problems that the original Andromeda had. It is very big, it is very slow, uh, it doesn't have a lot of extra toys to play with to supplement its abilities, and it is far too engineering heavy in the bridge officer seating. I remember when the uh, the 10th anniversary bundle was announced and they announced that this, what the uh, stats were going to, going to be for this ship, I remember being really disappointed that they didn't take the opportunity to make this ship into a flight deck carrier, or at least do something to give it a hangar bay, because with the size of the Galaxy class, it's got three shuttle bays on it, it would have been nice to be able to... Uh, to give it a hangar bay in order to kind of like recreate that scene in uh, Deep Space Nine where, you know, the uh, the Odyssey is flying alongside with the uh, the Deep Space Nine shuttlecraft, but, you know, minus the exploding. But yeah, it would, have just been, it would have been cool to recreate that vibe by giving this thing a hangar bay, but nope, it's just an exploration cruiser and it's very underwhelming. Honestly, if you want to get your hands on a Galaxy class ship that doesn't suck, either put up with the third nacelle and get the Dreadnought here or get the World Razor. Next up is the Legendary Scimitar. Obviously, that's going in S tier. This is a fantastic ship. It's, for one, it's a Scimitar. It's, you know, they're called Dreadnoughts, but I mean, they're set up more like Juggernauts with a hangar bag, just minus with the, minus the, uh, the Juggernaut array. But these things are fantastic ship, fantastic ships. They, uh, the Legendary version is a full Intel ship, so you can do a really nice energy weapon build on it but it still maintains the Lieutenant Commander command seat that the original Scimitars had, so you can do a really good torpedo build on it as well. And it's a 5-3 layout, so again, good for a forward-facing energy weapon build or a torpedo build because you'll still have room for that Maelstrom torpedo. It's got a hangar bay, and in fact, uh, the Scimitars were the ones that introduced those old uh, Romulan drone frigates, which are still very good frigates, and of course, this will give you the option to unlock those as well and still be able to use them. Or, you know, you can use something more conventional like the Type 7s for the debuff, but yeah, you've got options there. Because this is a flagship, this one will also come with uh, most of the flagship technology set, and it'll also come with the old Tier 5 Scimitar consoles, which, you know, as a set, will unlock the ability to use the Thaleron Burst weapon, which... I mean, it's it's very niche. I mean, I know there are ways to like cheese it in order to do like crazy things with it in ISE, but that's very like niche focused stuff. But even then, it's still like a fun toy to have, you know, just for the sake of screwing around to, and to get the uh, the true scimitar experience. But yeah, solid ship. Definitely recommend. Moving on to another disappointment, the legendary sovereign. That's going in C. Uh, fun fact, uh, the Legendary Sovereign stats are almost identical to the Legendary Excelsiors. So this is a, another 4 fork Miracle Worker cruiser with a secondary pilot seat. And I don't, I don't know how that happened. Literally, the only difference is I think one of them has like an extra universal seat that the other one doesn't have. Okay, never mind. It's not the only difference because that's the Excelsiors and then there, there's the Sovereigns. So not a 100%, uh, not 100% exact. The, uh, the Sovereign gets a little bit more tactical seating, but the Excelsior gets a little bit more universal seating, but they are still very similar in setup. But they are similar enough that the Legendary Sovereign has a lot of the same problems that the Legendary Excelsior has. They are full cruisers, so they can't equip dual cannons. Uh, they have 4-4 four, four weapons layout, so you're really only going to be ideal for a broadsider build. And they have a secondary pilot seat, which you're not going to get that much use out of, especially on just normal cruisers. This is another one that I really wish they had taken the opportunity to change things up a bit more, because... It's it's too much like its original counterpart. They made it an assault cruiser, which an assault cruiser is literally just a normal cruiser. The term assault is just uh, was a way to distinguish it between uh, the original the two tier five uh, cruisers from back when the game originally launched. So that's all. That's pretty much just where that comes from. So. Yeah, I, honestly, I really wish they had taken the initiative and decided to make this something like a battle cruiser or something. That would have been much more fitting to what we expect out of a Sovereign class ship, because these things are supposed to be much more tactical focused than uh, most other Federation ships, particularly, you know, most other Enterprises, really. So yeah, just by making this a battle cruiser, actually scratch that, making this a 5-3 battle cruiser definitely would have pushed this up into the A category, but no, as it is, this is sticking in C. The Legendary Talis. I'm going to put this one in A. This is a very solid ship. Uh, it's really good for uh, torpedo builds or energy weapon builds because it is an Intel command ship, much like uh, the Scimitar is. But I'm, the reason I'm putting it in A is because there are other ships that can do everything that it can do, but better. The Scimitar being one of them because, I mean, like they are shockingly similar ships. Basically, the, the Talis is basically just a tiny version of the Scimitar, 
without a lot of the bells and whistles that the scimitar has. So it's it's weird that they decided to make those two so similar. And beyond that, everything that the Talis can do, the Eagle class can do just as well, if not better, because the Eagle is also a, uh, a ship with a secondary Lieutenant Commander command seat, so it's good for a torpedo build, and it has an enhanced battle cloak, so it can fire while cloaked. And But th then there's the question of accessibility, because this is a legendary ship, whereas the Eagle is a normal sea store ship, so you're going to have much more access to that than you are to this. So, I mean, it's a solid ship. It's a really nice ship. If you really want to go for that whole Romulan Space Barbie, this is a good option. I definitely like this one better than uh, than the original promo version, which is uh, Temporal Pilot, which is a weird combo. But generally, I feel like people who like this ship are going to like either the Scimitar or the Eagle better. Next up is the legendary Valdor. This is honestly, I'm tempted to put this one in S, but I feel like it's a bit better suited for a, just because it's not 100% perfect because, for one, the seating, it does have a secondary pilot seat. I feel like it would have been better served with a secondary intel seat, but you gotta, you know, shake it up a little bit. The, Rom the legendary Romulan ships are already very heavy with the intel seating because of these two, and there are only four of them. But at the same time, this is a ship that has a 4-2 a weapons layout with, a, with an experimental weapon slot. Uh, it's very fast. It's very maneuverable. It's a strike wing escort, which which actually, again, this is, I think, is the only strike wing escort on the list, too. So there's a, another unique point for it there. But yeah, overall, it's a nice ship. I often use this thing as a uh, cannon scatter volley boat. You could use beam overload on it if you uh, would prefer. Honestly, it would probably be better for beam overload because uh, that plus recursive shearing are often good combos. But yeah, I like it with uh, scatter volley. And it's, just, it's a fun ship. I've really enjoyed it. This is like the main ship I use on my Romulan tactical character just because I like it. But uh, it's just, it doesn't have quite enough for, to make me uh, want to put it in S as much as I want to. You know, it's kind of like with the legendary Akira. I really like it, but I know it's not like the best thing in the game in, in comparison to some of these other options. Next up is the legendary Verity, aka the legendary Odyssey. And I'm going to do something that is probably going to surprise a lot of you. That's going in A. I know it's an Odyssey. You, you, from me, you would think that would go in S. But honestly, the, the legendary Odyssey has kind of aged a little bit at this point just because it's a dreadnought which is nice it doesn't have a it doesn't have a spinal lance unfortunately but it does still have a hangar bay uh it's a full command ship which is cool but it doesn't have a secondary seat it only has the one uh full command seat there is no secondary seating on it and it would have been much better served to have like a secondary intel or even a miracle worker seat on it or really anything honestly but they just gave it the one spec seat which i always found to be kind of odd and additionally, it is a 4-4 weapons layout, just like all the other Odysseys, which is unfortunate too. It used to be a pretty decent torpedo boat. I used to fly it as a torpedo boat pretty often, but then the Maelstrom torpedoes came out. And, you know, now 5-3 is back on top for torp boats, so that kind of went out. It does still make a really good tank build because of that hangar bay. You can put the Type 7s on it and it is a full command ship, but it still doesn't meet something like um, the Styx, which is still probably the best tank in the game at this point. But yeah, it's it's a really nice ship, especially if you like tank builds, but it just doesn't have quite enough to make me want to put it into S tier, especially when you take into account the fact that there is also the Lexington, which I like better because it has uh, uh, more variety in the uh, the seating and specializations because that's uh, America Worker Intel. So that's really good for a, uh, an energy weapon build, but you could still use that as a tank if you'd like. It's not going to be as support tanky heavy as the Verity can be, but uh, America Worker can still be pretty useful as a like a personal tank just for sheer survivability. And there's also the accessibility issue because the Lexington is a normal sea store ship, whereas the Verity is only available in the 10th anniversary bundle. So <laughs> yeah, Le Lexington wins on too many points in comparison to the Verity. Moving on to the legendary Vorcha, we'll throw this one in A too. This is still a pretty solid ship. Um, I do kind of like the uh, the legendary Akira a bit better because it has a little bit more miracle worker seating on it, and it does have a hangar bay. But the legendary Vorcha is still a battle cruiser, which is nice. Uh, it is a five three layout, so you'll have room for that maelstrom if you want to go that route. But um, it does still have enough in the miracle worker seating that you could still uh, utilize that to buff some energy weapons if you would prefer to go for an energy weapon build on this thing. Honestly, there's really not that much more to say about it, just because, I mean, yeah, it's uh, mostly going to be a tank or a torpedo build focused ship, but it can go with uh, energy weapons if you want to. And just, I don't know, I'll, the thing with this ship is that a lot of what it can do can be done by a lot of other different ships on 
uh, this list at the same time, which I guess is true for a lot of ships also. So I don't know, I guess, and, you know, I said I wasn't going to really judge these things too hard based on the bundles they come in. But really, given that this ship was kind of the only thing that was of the bit, this was kind of the main appeal to the uh, the 11th anniversary bundle, which uh, is unfortunate because the other three were kind of eh. So it's kind of a lot to ask for just getting the one ship. So I feel like this one gets over overlooked a lot just due to the general uh, uh, just general unfavor out the unfavored outlook on the 11th anniversary bundle because that's kind of dragged down by the legendary Excelsior and the legendary Burrell and the legendary ambassador. Mostly legendary Burrell. You suck. The legendary Walker class. This is another one. I really want to like it. I, I do. I do like it for the most part, but it's just, it's got one or two things that just really I can't look that far past. So this one's going in B. It's a 5-3 command battle cruiser, which is nice. It's good for a torpedo build. You can put a solid tank on it as well, but it does have a secondary pilot seat on it, which isn't amazing. It's not as bad as it used to be, but it's not great. But the big problem with this thing is that it has uh, two uh, engineering seats, a uh, commander level engineering seat and a lieutenant level engineering seat. For torpedo builds especially, that's still a lot of engineering seating, and it wouldn't be so bad if they had put the pilot seat on that lieutenant level engineering seat, but no, they put that on the on the universal seat. So, yeah, this is... I do like it, but it's it's too engineering heavy, and I wish I wish it wasn't. It sucks, especially because it's a very pretty ship. Like this, uh, this is the uh, the Shenzhou class skin, but this will also come with the Georgiou class skin, which is that TMP era skin for the Walker class. Which God, that thing is gorgeous. I love that thing. And last is the legendary Kalion Multi Mission Explorer. Is that what they called it? Yeah, that's what they called it. Yeah, Multi Mission Explorer. I don't know why they call it an Explorer. It's a science ship, and it's going in B. It's not a bad science ship. Intel is still pretty good for, you know, science, EPG and patrol stuff and uh, control stuff. But at the same time, it would have been nice if they had mixed in a secondary temporal seat in there, especially considering that the uh, uh, the original T6 versions of the Vestas, those all had a science seat on them, despite not being full spec. But yeah, it's, just, it's weird that those had a temporal seat and this one didn't. Uh, I just, but yeah, they made it full Intel instead, which again, isn't terrible, but it, it definitely kind of sets it behind uh, the Glen here, which is a full temporal ship. I guess the thinking with this one was to give it more of a do size setup too, because uh, all that Intel seating, uh, you, you know, you've got room for stuff like um, override subsystem safeties, but you still have enough room for uh, several anomalies like um, uh, ionic turbulence. So I imagine that was the thinking because this ship does also come with the um, the auxiliary cannons, which are uh, energy weapons that feed off of your auxiliary power. Those were introduced on the old Vestas, and this being the legendary Vesta, of course, it includes those as well. So yeah, it's a it's a decent science ship. I don't think it's as good as as the Glen, but it's definitely better than the Intrepid. So yeah, I feel like B is a good middle ground there. In fact, it literally is the middle ground, but you, you get what I mean. So overall, I'm fairly happy with his lists. I mean, there's probably an argument to be made to move some of these around. Like, uh, I'm still a little tempted to put the uh, the Ross into D, not just because, you know, Enterprise D would have been a funny joke, but yeah, God, that was such a disappointment. And um, I don't know. I feel like some of these could be moved. You know, some of these between S and A could have been uh, moved around. Like I imagine some people are going to say like the uh, the Ross should have been in S because that is a still a uh, a very good science vessel. But you know, like they always say, nothing beats the Vern. So I feel like on that merit alone, you know, <laughs> it'll stay in A because of that. So to reiterate, uh, the S tiers, these are just like the best of the best. These are ones that are going to have the most mass appeal. These are the ones that are really good at what the at the uh, build types that they're suited for. These are just really good ships. A tier, they're still really good. They're they've got like a couple small flaws on them uh, that just kind of push them that just barely push them out of S tier. So they're kind of just almost there, but. You know, they're still really fun to fly and, really, you know, really solid ships overall. They'll get you through any sort of content whatsoever. Uh, the Bs, uh, they're kind of like the ones, they're still serviceable ships. They're, you know, you can still get them through pretty much any kind of content, but you're more interested in them for the Space Barbie than their actual stats. And then uh, the Cs, uh, you're definitely more interested in the Space Barbie than the actual stats. So you're using these in spite of their stats because you can still make them work. And uh, then with the uh, the Ds, these are just the unforgivable disappointments.
So yeah, that was my tier list for the legendary ships available in Star Trek Online. Uh, I will keep this list around. I am going to save it and periodically update it as new legendary ships get introduced into the game. So you'll probably see this list pop up again if I ever have to do any uh, review videos for any future legendary ships. So yeah, uh, let me know what you thought of this list down below in the comments. I'm sure all of you have your own opinions, so be sure to post them down there. And while you're down there, be sure to like and subscribe and hit that bell for notifications. If you would like to further support the channel, you can hit that join button to become a member. Uh, there's also the merch store down there. I also have affiliate codes with both Epic Games and Real Merch. So if you're ever shopping for video games or Zen for Star Trek Online on the Epic Games store, uh, you can use my code uh, STU1701. Helps me out a little bit, and I do appreciate that. And by helps me out, it, it I, I get money from that. And, you know, money helps keep me alive because we live in a capitalist hellscape. It's the same with real merch, so if you're ever shopping for Star Trek models from the Eagle Moss collection or any other co uh, collections that Eagle Moss had back in the day, uh, real merch is selling a bunch of those. And uh, if you use uh, the code STU1701 uh, over there, you'll actually get a 10% uh, discount with that. Either way, though, thank you so much for watching. My name's Stu, and I will see you guys next time.